All right, good morning, everybody. Um, chapter 11 today. Uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, public goods and common resources. This is, this is a nice short chapter uh, to reward you guys for all the hard work that you did um, at home on the midterm. Uh, and uh, so let's get started. What we're going to be thinking about, the answers to the questions that you're going to want to look for is, what's a public good? What's a common resource? Give examples of each. You'll probably, as I start to explain them, under, kind of be able to think pretty easily about what public goods and common resources are. Um, but the big key thing here we're going to think about is why do markets fail to provide the efficient amounts of, amounts of these goods? So if you recall from last chapter, right, when the market isn't working, when the market's broken, that's called a market. Anyone remember? Market failure, OK? And so we're going to see with public goods and common resources another market failure. And so just like we learned about in chapter 10 with the externalities, when there's a market failure, generally what's the way to fix it? How did we fix it in chapter 10? Who fixed it? The government fixed it. OK, good. So that's, that's the general idea. We learned about uh, in chapter 10 how markets can break when there is an externality, meaning that there's somebody outside the marketplace that's affected positively or negatively by the, uh, the trade of the good in the marketplace. And so we had the government stepped in and fix that. Here we're going to look at a new marketplace, a marketplace for public goods or the marketplace for common resources that are also broken for a different reason. And then once again, the appropriate response could possibly be to have the government step in and get involved. And I'll show you how that can happen. Okay. Um, so that's the third question is, how is the government going to get involved to fix these broken markets? Okay? All right. So uh, I want you to start thinking of goods that we consume without paying. Okay? So for example, parks, national defense, air, water, right? Um, we, we, we use these goods, we consume them, but there's no price. Okay, so, so this is a market difference from every other good that we've kind of thought about so far. We thought about the, good f the market for like hamburgers or hot dogs or apples or things like that before, right? Where there's a clearly defined price, you go to the, to the seller, you exchange some quantity of money and then you can take the, the good home and then you consume it, right? But now we're going to get in this whole different class of goods that uh, we don't have to pay for, right? Uh, parks. National defense. You probably never even thought about being protected as a good that you're consuming, right? But we don't, we don't really pay for that directly, right? We pay for that through our taxes, of course. But um, these are examples of goods, a whole new group of goods that, uh, that we don't pay for, OK? Now, this is the problem. Because when the goods have no prices, then everything falls apart, basically. The market forces that generally allocate goods to individuals are no longer in, in effect. Remember that on a regular supply and demand curve, OK, this is a supply and this is demand. Let's say this is for the, a regular good such as hamburgers, right? What adjusts so that there's no shortage or surplus, right? Yeah, the price adjusts. So if the price is too high, there is going to be a surplus, right? And what adjusts to fix that? The price goes down, or the price goes up until we get to the equilibrium price, right? So in a regular marketplace, the changing price is what makes everything work out. It makes the maximum total surplus, right? So it ma maximizes consumer and producer surplus. And the other key thing is that the people who value the goods the most get them, and the people who is easiest and cheapest to produce the goods produce them, right? But now I'm telling you all of a sudden there's this class of goods with no price, right? <laughs> this is an issue because thus far our entire analysis and the entire marketplace hinged upon the price moving up and down. So now there's no price, now there's a big problem, OK? So, that's, so this, is, this is the issue. So basically the private market, which is what we describe when we just talk about the regular marketplace, all by itself with no government involvement, the market all, all by itself is not going to know how much quantity to produce because there's no price. Because the price is the thing that, that goes up and down and tells the suppliers and the demanders how much to produce and consume, respectively. Okay. So in this case, 
we can turn to one of our big principles, which is what? Governments sometimes can improve market outcomes. And specifically, governments are really useful when we have what's called a broken marketplace, a market failure. Okay? And so because of the missing price, this is going to be just like a market failure or a broken market. Okay? Um, and so let's classify some goods, or just like all goods that are possible that you could buy, let's classify them right now. First, let's think about a term called excludable. So a good that you buy is excludable if you can prevent someone else from using it. Okay? If you can prevent someone else from using it. An apple, a fish taco, <laughs> these are excludable goods, right? I can buy it and I can keep you guys from using my apple or my fish taco, right? I can keep you guys from doing that. Um, a pretty sunset. Can I keep you guys from looking a pretty sun at a pretty sunset? No, right? OK, so that's an example of a good that's not excludable, right? So these, there's this class of goods that's kind of weird that you probably have never thought about that we're going we're gonna to think about a lot today, OK? So here you go, right? Fish tacos, even wireless internet access, right? You can put a password on wireless internet access, right? Um, so those are, those are excludable. What are things that are not excludable? FM radio signals? Right? You can't put a password on the, on the regular radio. Right? Anyone can listen to the radio. National defense, that's, that's one, right? You can't prevent the person next to you from not being defended by, by national defense. Right? It's not excludable. Anyone can consume the good. Okay? Now, here's this other term that you, I want you to, to learn. It's called rival in consumption. Okay? Rival in consumption. So it's different from excludable. What rival in consumption means is that when I use up the good, like it get, it, when I consume the good, it gets used up, and you can no longer use the good. Does that make sense? OK. So fish tacos, my favorite, right? I had some for dinner last night, actually. Ahi tuna steaks, very good. I digress. Fish tacos. If I eat fish tacos, there's none left for you to eat. It's rival in consumption. Does that make sense? If you use the good, there's none for me to use up. Uh, something that's not rival, an MP3 download of Kanye West, right? If you use, if you consume the MP3 download, it doesn't use it up for me, right? You, I can still use it, right? If you're, if you go to a park and use the park, it doesn't use up the park. I can still come and use it. Does that make sense? OK. So there's these two, uh, two ways to classify every good. You can look at a good and you say, is it excludable? Yes, no. And then, is it rival in consumption? Yes, no. OK? And so let's look at the different kinds of goods. So a private good is what we're going to call something that's excludable and rival in consumption. Excludable and rival in consumption. This is the most popular type of good, right? This is your hamburger, your fish taco, your apple. This is what you think of when you think of a good on the marketplace. OK? An example is food. OK? On the side of your notes, I'm going to give you a, a, a graphic that's from the textbook that I think makes it really easy. We're going to classify the goods. We're going to classify them by excludable or not excludable. And then we're going to classify them by rival or not rival. Right? These are the, the two different things. So you can see there's four total options I could possibly have, right? I could have excludable and rival, excludable and not rival, therefore, therefore and so on. So the excludable and rival go, is called a private good. And we'll have an example, food. OK? I'll put a little star right here because this is the most popular. Like this is the most, when, when you think of a good, this is what you think of, a private good. OK? All right. 
Let's talk about, now let's bring up a kind of good called a public good. They're not excludable and not rival. So if I were to put this on here, not excludable and not rival, this would go down here. Something called a public good. OK. And an example of that one is my national defense. Right? National defense. When you use up national defense, I, I, or excuse me, when you use up national defense, it's not rival. That means I can still use up national defense, right? At the same time, it's not excludable, right? I can't keep you from being defended by national defense. So it's not excludable. OK. Common resources. These are things that are rival but not excludable. So where does that go in our chart? It's rival but not excludable. So we'll call this common resources. Re Sources. So think about what something that would be rival but not excludable. Meaning when you use the good, it uses it up, and I can't use it anymore, but it's, it's not excludable. I can't keep you away from using it. What is an example of something like that? Whoops. Fish in the ocean. Right? Anyone can go catch fish. I can't exclude you from catching fish, therefore it's not excludable. But it is rival. When you go catch up the fit, catch the fish, they're gone, and I can't catch them anymore. Okay, so we'll say fish in ocean. Okay, and finally, there's this these type of goods called club goods, and they go in this category. They're excludable but not rival. Club goods. And an example of this would be cable TV. Right? So let's think about it. Club goods. It's excludable, meaning you can keep some people from watching cable TV, right? Like you could just scramble the signal and then not everybody can get cable TV. But by you using up cable TV, it doesn't take it away from me. I can also use it. You can hook as many TVs as you want to, to the cable outlet coming out of the wall, right? It doesn't use it up. OK, so let's do cable TV here. OK, so these are the four kinds of goods that uh, pretty much any good that you consume can be put into one of these four groups. Okay. We've done a lot of talking about private goods thus far already. Okay. Um, in this chapter, before I go on to the next thing, in this chapter, we're only going to look at common resources and public goods. We're going to look at these guys. Okay. And the reason why is because this. They're not excludable. So if something is not excludable, that means you can use it and nobody can keep you from it, is anyone willing to pay for that product? Right? If you could just use the, the good and nobody can stop you, would you be willing to pay for it? No, right? Because someone can go up to you and be like, yeah, it's 50 cents to come in this park. And you're like, OK, no. And then you just walk in the park anyway, right? Because it's not excludable. OK? So the whole idea is these two types of goods, common resources and public goods, they're, they're, because they're not excludable, there's no price. See? And that's the problem. There's no price for these goods. So these guys get messed up because there's no price because everything depends on the price, right? In our regular markets. Okay? Example fish in the ocean. If someone came up to you and said, mm, it costs $5 to fish in this ocean, you'd be like, no. And then you'd go fish anyway, right? So no one is willing to pay anything, so there's no price for these products. OK? All right. I want you now to uh, think about a road, OK, a road. And I want you to figure out whether it's a private good, a club good, a common resource, or a public good, OK? A road is which of the four kinds of goods? Uh, and here's the hint I want to give you is that it could be more than one. It depends on whether the road is congested or not and whether it's a toll road or not. 
So consider all the different cases. I'll give you like two or three minutes. It, it could fit into more than one of these groups. What is a road? All right. So what do we got going on here? Let's ask, is a road rival in consumption or is it non-rival? Well, if it's an open freeway and no one's on it, and I get on the freeway, and you get on the freeway, we're not using up each other's good, right? So it's totally non-rival if it's just a completely open freeway. But if there's a ton of traffic and there's only room for one more car on and I get on, then it's rival because I just used up your space. You know what I mean? So it's, if it's congested, it's rival in consumption. What about excludable? Whoops. Uh, is it excludable? Well, if it's a toll road, it's, it's excludable, right? There's like, you know, a toll booth that <laughs> prevents you to get on, from getting on if you haven't paid, right? So a regular freeway that you just jump on, it's totally not excludable. But if it's a toll road, it is uh, excludable. So that leaves us four options, right? If we have an uncongested non-toll road, right? So just a freeway that anyone can get on and it's not traffic-y, well, we would call that a public good, right? Because it's not excludable and it's not rival in consumption, OK? But what happens if it's an uncongested toll road? So uncongested means it's still non-rival, but it's a toll road, meaning that you can exclude people from getting on it. That's called club good, right? Um, there, we there we go. Now, if it's congested, I mean there's a lot of traffic, non-toll road, that's a common resource, right? Congested means it's rival, okay? But it's an open freeway, non-toll road, so it's going to be here, common resources, right? You can use it up. Finally, a congested toll road, we'll call that a private good, okay? It's congested, so if you use it up, it uses up mine. And then it's a toll road, so it is excludable, therefore it's a private good. Okay? So the, the, the road could be all four of the different types, just depending upon the different situation. Right? So that's just kind of an exercise to get you thinking about categorizing the goods appropriately. Because this is an important thing. Because why, why is it important? Remember. The common resource and the public good, these are the two goods we're talking about in class today, these are the ones for which there's a huge problem because there's no price, right? So if someone asks you, hey, should the government get involved in the congested toll road market? You'd say, mm, private good, no, probably not, because uh, the private market works, works fine, right? But then if they asked you, should the government get involved in a congested non-toll road? like the 405 freeway during rush hour, right? Well, you'd be like, it's a common resource. I know from principles of micro that common resources have this price problem. So yes, the, the government should definitely get involved, right? And it's true. Who builds the 405? Not private people. The government built the 405, OK? All right, so um, we're focusing on the public goods and common resources, these ones that I've circled here. and. The issue, once again, that you have to remember, there's no price. You can't force somebody to pay for something that they can use anyway without paying. No one's going to pay. Okay. So again, we have this kind of externality problem, which means the market is broken, which means that's another way of saying there's a market failure. So there's scope for government intervention here. So here we go. So private decisions about consumption and production won't be right because the marketplace is broken, so we need the government to get involved. That's what we mean when we say public policy. The government can create some policy. OK. Uh, public goods. So we're down here. Public goods. We're thinking about things that are non-excludable, non-rival, like national defense. Right? We're talking about nothing like national defense. So public goods are difficult for private markets to provide because of the free rider problem. Now let me explain this. OK? And here's. You kind of know this already. Who provides national defense for the United States? Is it the government or is it private part, the private market? It's the government, right? The issue is the free rider problem. Okay, a free rider. This is a, it's just exactly what it sounds. They people who ride for free. <laughs> it's a person who receives the benefit of a good but doesn't pay for it. Right?
So a kind of funny example are of a free rider. Uh, is someone who gets the benefits of a good but doesn't pay for it. Let's say that you go into Best Buy and you have a bunch of questions about, so you want to buy a new TV. And you want to buy it on Amazon. But the problem on Amazon is you can't see the TV in person on, in, on Amazon.com. And you might have a couple questions about what ports on the back you can plug into. So what do you do? You go into Best Buy, <laughs> right? And you check it out. And you ask the salesman all the questions, right? You use up that good, not the good of buying the TV, but the good of all of the information. And then you say, thank you for your help. And then you go home and then click buy on Amazon, right? So that's an example of being a free rider because you can get the good for free, the information, right? And not have to pay for it. Does that make sense? Okay. So that's what a free rider is. And anytime something's non excludable, you're going to have the free rider problem, right? If you said ever, told everybody, hey, we're going to build a park and everybody has to pay $5 to build the park, right? Some people would say, like, mm, no. But then they would use the park anyway when it's, when it's built, right? So that's, the, that's called a free rider. All right? So if a good is not excludable, people have incentive to be free riders, meaning they want to be free riders. Because why would I pay for something that I could get for free, right? That's the idea. For, and if, if, if the good is, good is not excludable, firms cannot prevent non payers from consuming the good, right? So we have this, we have this like foundational problem with this good. Like if I can't prevent people from, from using it, then I can't force them to pay for it. So our firm's gonna say, hey, I know, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, build a park. No, because they're not gonna be able to profit off of it, right? So the private market's not gonna work to build a park, all right? So the good is not, wouldn't be pr produced in the private market even if buyers collectively value the good higher than the cost of providing it, right? So even if you asked everybody in the city, how much would you like to have a park? And everybody says, yeah, I'd be willing to pay up to like $5 for it, right? So everybody's WTP is $5. So the park is worth a lot to people. And let's say it was really cheap to produce. There's no company that would be willing to produce the park because no one's actually going to pay for the park. People are just going to use it for free, right? So the only person who can build a park is, a, is the government, OK? Because no, no individual private factory or firm is going to produce it because they won't be able to charge a price for it. Does that make sense? So that's a bummer. Because if the benefit of a public good exceeds the cost of providing it, we want it to happen. We want the, if people value the park more than it costs to make a park, well, we want there to be a park, right? Except for no private factory will build the park because they can't charge anybody a price for it, right? So who needs to step, step in? The government should step in and provide the good. And then what, how do they pay for it? Well, they go ahead and tax everybody. Right? The government's the only person that can force people to pay for stuff, right? With a tax. Okay, so this is actually another helpful tax, right? If, if everybody is better off with the park, but no company is going to step in and build the park because they can't charge it, the government can say, hey, I can fix this problem. I'll build you a park. I'll charge you for it, called the tax, and then everybody's actually going to be better off because now we have a park. Okay. So that sounds nice in, in abstract. In, in actuality, this is, this is a bit of a problem. Measuring the benefit of a park is usually difficult. How do you measure how much happiness in some people's heart from having a park? It's very difficult. It's pretty easy to measure the cost of a park, right? You can be like, okay, I need a bulldozer for this many hours, and I need some grass, and I need a swing set, and you know, maybe a little fountain, and then I'm done, right? And then I have a park. But I have to compare the cost of the park to the benefit of the park in everybody's heart, right? That part's kind of difficult. Does that make sense? Um, so the, the branch of economics that deals with doing that is called cost-benefit analysis, right? It compares the costs and the benefits of providing a public good, right? So the costs are generally easier. The benefits are a little bit harder. Sometimes what people can do in cost-benefit analysis is they'll, like, they'll look at some individuals who are buying a private good that's kind of like a park. So let's say that they notice that families tend to go to um, 
I don't know, Tanaka Farms family watermelon picking patch or something. I don't know, right? But it's a, it's a private farm, so they get to charge people to come in. And they're like, oh, that's kind of similar. And I noticed that people on average are willing to pay $10 to come into this park place. So I'm going to guess that each household is willing to pay about $10 for the park, which is how much it's worth to everybody. Does that make sense? And so then you can add up the $10 to everybody in the, in the city, and then you're like, that's probably what the benefit of the park is. OK, so that's kind of the way that, that, they, that they do it. Um, but of course, it's not exact. <laughs> what I just explained to you is not, is not an exact science. So it's much more difficult to provide the right quantity of public goods than it is to provide the right quantity of private goods. We actually don't even have to try to provide the right quantity of private goods because the private market takes care of it all by itself. But for public goods, you have to really kind of check hard. You have to do a, this, a lot of this estimating to get the right quantity of public goods. Okay, so let's think of some important public goods that are provided by the government. Okay, we've used national defense about 100 times. But that's super important. We all need that. <laughs> We're all willing to pay for it. Well, we all value it at some dollar value, but nobody's actually going to pay for it because I wouldn't have to, right? No one's actually going to pay some company to protect the whole United States because you're like, hmm. I could also just live here and not pay and be protected, so I'll do that, right? Um, here's another important public goods: just general knowledge that's created through research, right? So research happens, and now we know more things, right? Way back a long time ago, people didn't know that germs cause sickness, and then all of a sudden, I think it was Louis Pasteur, maybe discovered that germs cause sickness. That general knowledge helped our society a lot, didn't it? <laughs> then we realized we should wash our hands. Okay? That, the value of that knowledge is extremely high. Right? And, uh, but that's not, it's not like excludable. You can't keep some people, that knowledge, away from some people, right? Because the knowledge will spread to everybody. So there's no price. So this kind of knowledge, while valuable, is impossible to be provided on a private market. Okay. Here's another important public goods: the fight against poverty. Right, that's important. Um, and so all of these have that have that same problem: that there's no price, so the government is the one that has to provide these goods. Okay. Um, so I want you know I want you guys to use this class in the rest of your lives, and just an an idea here is when the government steps in and starts providing something or stops providing something, you should think to yourself, what kind of good is that? Right? If the government said, oh, we're going to provide bicycles for everybody, although on the, on the surface it might sound really good, right? Oh, everybody gets to ride their bike and things like that, right? But a bicycle is clearly a private good, right? And we know that if we just let the government, or excuse me, if we just let the marketplace do its thing, the exact efficient number of bicycles are going to be produced. Right? So we might not want the government to be involved with providing bicycles. If, on the other hand, the government says, I'm going to pay for a university system whose goal is to do research, then you might say, hmm, that is maybe a good use of government funds. Right? Okay. And so just kind of an idea how to, how to use this in the future. OK, let's go ahead and switch from public goods to common resources. So again, we still have this no price problem. But now this is different because this is a rival good, meaning you can use it up. So it's going to change the ideas a little bit. OK? So again, common resources are not excludable. So you have the free rider problem. You have the no price problem, right? Common resources uh, don't have, they have free riders. And therefore, individual firms are not going to produce something that they can't charge people for, right? That's basic. Um, and so, what's the what? What should the who should step in? The government. What should the government do? Make sure that they're provided for everybody. So let's let's talk a little bit about this, um, because there's this additional problem with common resources 
is that they can be used up, right? So not only do we want to make sure they're there in the first place, but now the government also has to make sure that it doesn't get used up too quickly because that's this additional problem, right? So because each person's use reduces others' ability to, to use it, now we need, the government needs to ensure that they are not overused. Okay, so that's additional role for the government. Back with the public good slides, you know, the government just made sure that it created the public good. Now with the common resource idea, not only does the government need to see that they're provided, but they need to see that they're not used up because of the arrival and consumption. Okay, so common resources has this thing called the tragedy of the common resources, or sometimes it's shortened to tragedy of commons. It is kind of a dramatic title, I guess, <laughs> the tragedy of common resources. But let me explain it to you, okay? Um, and in order to explain it to you, I'm going to use a parable or a story, okay, what, to show why common resources are used up. And we're going to call this the tragedy of the common resource. It's because everybody uses it up. And then it's not there anymore. Okay? So here's what happens. Let's imagine, and here's the original story that was told. That it's not a story I made up. This is some economist a long time ago thought this was an awesome story. So we have a medieval town where there's sheep and they're grazing on common land. So there's this uh, sheep field pasture, I guess, in the middle of the town. And everybody's house is around it, right? And everybody owns sheep. And what do sheep need? They need to eat grass, so they go on to the pasture in the middle and they eat the grass. Okay. As the population grows, everybody has more. Everybody has sheep, and so as you get more people, there's more sheep, right? So more sheep, they're coming and, and they're eating the grass here. Uh, and so the amount of land is set; it's fixed, right? Now that pasture, what kind of good is it? It's a common resource. What? Because it's rival, meaning if your sheep eat that grass, my sheep can't eat that grass. Right? It's rival, but it's not excludable. It's just a field. Anyone can come in and jump in the field, right? So it's clearly of a com it's clearly common resource. And what happens? As the amount of sheep grow, grows, what happens to the, the grass? It all starts disappearing, right? Because if you eat grass just a little bit, that's fine because it can just grow back the next day or the next week or something, right? But if you have a ton of sheep and they all eat the grass, it's gone. And then it can't grow back because it's gone, right? Okay. So the, the private incentives, which is using the land for free, right? Each individual person, what do they want to do? I just want to use up the land. I don't want to pay for it. I want to get my sheep to eat as much as possible, right? But what's best for actually society as a whole? Let's be careful with our land so we have enough. You know what I mean? And so here we've got a problem. Because remember, way back in, uh, oh, what chapter was it? I think it was chapter four. Um, the father of economics, we read this quote from him, and he basically says, if everybody just argues, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, I don't know, I think he said the, the brewer. But he said, if everybody just argues to try to get the best price possible, it's OK, because what everybody wants to do naturally ends up being what's best for society. Remember? That's in the regular marketplace for private goods, what everybody wants to do individually also ends up being best for society. So we're cool with that, right? But here, look at this. We've got something interesting going on. What everybody wants to do privately is just use up as much grass as possible and not pay, is not what's best for all of society, which is to carefully manage our grass. Okay. And so in the end, what happens? Everybody goes out of business or they become poor, or whatever. They, they lose their livelihood because they can't raise sheep anymore. And so now everyone's worse off because we overgraze the land. OK? OK. All right, so where, why do we have a tragedy? Where's the tragedy of the common resource? Well, here's the tragedy right here. This is actually technically an externality. Remember what we learned about externalities last, last class? when some third party gets affected by your actions right, in the marketplace? Well, check this out. If you allow your flock to graze on the common lands, right, you're letting your sheep eat the grass, that's actually negatively impacting a third party, right? Why? Because I'm using up the grass. Now they can't use it anymore. Okay? So that's technically a negative externality, right? 
So what I'm talking about here is actually identical to what I talked about last chapter, chapter 10. It's just a negative externality. Um, and so because people neglect this external cost, right? what happens? What do we learn in chapter 10? If it's a negative externality, the private market produces too much or too little of the good. Do we remember? If there's something with a negative externality. We do too much. Right? So for the negative externality, the, the marketplace had a higher Q and we actually want the Q to be down lower. Right? So in this situation, the marketplace, all the people individually, want to have more sheep, but the socially optimal number of sheep is actually down here. Right? So we call that overgrazing or overuse of the land. Right? Okay. So um, does that make sense? So this is basically the tragedy of the economy. We'll talk about some solutions for it um, in a couple of minutes. But first, let's think about what the government can do to fix this. Uh, what could the townspeople, or more precisely their government, right? Because when there's negative externalities or common resources, the person to get involved is probably the government. What should it have done to prevent the tragedy? Any idea? So we have one idea. It's a tax. What else? What do you think? If you were in charge, how would you fix this tragedy? Okay. Control who can use it when. Okay. Have some sort of regulations. Okay. Any, idea, any other ideas? Okay. So remember the thing that we did when there was a negative externality. What's the best way to fix a negative externality? You tax people the amount of the extra, the negativeness, the negative externality, right? We decided that that was the best way to fix a negative externality. If we could somehow figure out when I bring my sheep to graze and it's hurting all the other families, if I could add up all of that hurt to the other families who have sheep and just tax the person who brings their sheep on it, boom, that would fix the problem, wouldn't it? Right? So we would internalize the externality. We learned about that last chapter. Okay, Then, like all of you guys said, you could regulate use of the land. Now, um, you can probably guess, do I like market-based solutions or command and control solutions better? Do you guys remember from last class? Market-based solutions, right? Allow, you just put the right benefits and the costs for the people and then you just let them make their own decision, right? A market-based solution is like maybe overly draconian, and not only that, it can actually uh, not, if the conditions then change and you still have the same regulation, it can actually be doing the wrong thing, right? So this would be considered a command and control approach, right? The same idea when the government just comes in and says, okay, all firms, all factories have to reduce their pollution by 50%. You could come in here and be like, okay, all shepherds have to reduce the number of sheep by 50%, so you have to kill 50% of your sheep or something like that, right? You could do that, right? And it would work. Uh, that's a kind of command and control. Or you could just tax people for having sheep, and then you can let the people make their decision on their own, right? If I ta start all of a sudden taxing people for having sheep, guess what? People are going to have fewer sheep all by themselves, right? You can kind of let them make their own decision. So this would be a market-based solution. This would be a command and control, OK? Another, uh, another thing you could do is tradable sheep grazing permits, right? Remember we talked about tradable pollution permits last class? You could do the exact same thing. You could say, I know that only 20 sheep can come onto this land to go ahead and uh, graze, right? So you could make 20 permits, and you could distribute them, or you could have people pay for them, or you could give them to a bunch of people, and then they could trade them on their own, right? But you only have 20 permits allowing sheep to come in there. And then finally, you could just turn it into a private good, right? You take the land, you put a fence around it, you divide it into lots, each has a fence, and then you sell each individual lot to individual families, right? And then there's no externalities at all because it's a private good. So I bring my sheep, I bring them just to my plot of land, and then they eat. And it doesn't harm anyone else because no one else is going to be eating off of this land, right? So this one, I've converted it into a private good. Does that make sense? So there's a number of things you could do. 
um, to, to fix this tragedy. OK. Let's talk about, yes, uh, what, the, what the policy options are to fix this thing. So there's the regulation. We just, we just talked about that, which is the command and control approach. Okay. There's the corrective tax, which is the market-based solution. Right. I, just, I just make people understand the right costs and benefits, and then I just let them go. Right. OK, so this is done. Right. You guys ever buy a hunting license or a fishing license? Right. Now you know why they charge you 5 bucks or 10 bucks for a fishing license. right? It's just a corrective tax, right? It's not to try to prevent people from fishing. It's just to keep people from overfishing, OK? You know, you go to Yosemite, it costs some money to get in. Right? You go down to the beach in Huntington Beach, you have to pay 15 bucks or something in the park. It's a California state park, right? The idea is to keep um, the overuse so it's not overused, right? OK. Uh, you could auction off the permits, like we talked about, right? Uh, this is actually done. So the US F the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, they are actually in charge of the airwaves, right? Now that's a total public good, right? Let's say that two uh, radio stations or two cell pro phone providers put up a tower right next to each other and they broadcast on the exact same frequency, right? It's going to, neither, nobody's going to be able to hear what is going on because you're going to get two radio stations at the same time into your radio, right? So what, is the, uh, what does the government do? Well, it divides up. If you can imagine the radio waves as like the pasture land, right? It divides up the radio waves and it sells off different permits to each people, to different, different people, right? And then they can, they can actually, I believe they can trade those to, to each other, right? So T-Mobile can buy a couple of, if I'm thinking now about cell phones and not radio stations anymore. Right, T-Mobile can buy permits for certain different radio waves, and Verizon can buy them for certain other radio waves. Right? Okay. And then finally, if the resource is land, it can actually turn it into private goods and sell those off to people. Okay. So let's talk about some common resources. Clean air and water. Why are those common resources? Well, they're rival in consumption. If I use up the air or the water or I make it dirty or something like that, you can't use it up anymore. But it's definitely not excludable. Right? Congested freeways or, or, any, or roads, any sort of road. Right? That's a common resource. It tends to get overused. That's why the freeway is crowded. Okay, fish, whales, and other wildlife. Probably the biggest uh, application of the common resource problem currently is overfishing in the ocean. Right? Are we all aware that we're in in this world on planet Earth? We're running out of fish in the ocean. Right? Why? Because it's a common resource. Right? I can't exclude people from fishing. So everybody just wants to go out there and catch as many fish as they can as quickly as they can before everybody else gets the fish, right? So everybody's overfishing. Okay. All right. So here's an interesting uh, application of the common resource problem. So spam, not not the meat actually, spam like a uh, uh, junk email, right? So firms use spam emails to advertise their, pro their products, right? You get them all the time. Um, unfortunately, spam is not excludable, right? You can't prevent the firm from spamming. You, you can't keep someone from sending out messages. Maybe you can put a filter on yours to keep your inbox from receiving them, but you definitely can't prevent someone from sending out a spam email, OK? But it is rival, right? Because if I just get one spam email, I might actually pay attention to it. If I get 50 spam emails, do I pay attention to it anymore? No. So it's rival in consumption. So I want you to think of the good here as, as the ability to spam, right? The, the ability to spam. So you're a company, and you, you're going to want to consume this good, which is the ability to spam people. Right? And so anyway, it's, uh, it's not excludable. It's rival, which means it's a common resource. So what always happens with common resources? 
the tragedy of common resources. So what does that mean? How can I apply it to the spam email? What's going to happen? In the sheep example, what happened to the, to the land? It was overused. In the spam example, same thing. What's going to happen to spam email? Overused, right? Spam's a common resource, and it's overused. Now, everybody can tell me <laughs> that spam is overused, right? It's too many. You, we all get too many spam email messages. This is not a surprise to anyone that spam is a common resource, and therefore, it's overused. All right, so finally, uh, we note that public goods are not provided. They're underprovided. So the government has to provide public goods. Common resources, on the other hand, maybe they're not provided. But if they are provided, they definitely are used too much. They're overused. Okay, so it's a, it's a problem on both of these. Uh, and why does it happen? It's because there's no price thing. Property rights are not well established. Right? You can't, uh, you can't exclude people from breathing air, so no one can charge polluters. Right? Uh, so you have too much pollution. Again, pollution overused. Does that make sense? Why pollution is overused? Um, right? So, so this is a common resource. This is a public good, a national defense. So you can't charge people for consuming national defense. So it's public good. So there gets too little of it. Okay. And finally, uh, the way that we can fix it is the government can fix it uh, by the policies that we talked about. Okay, so basically, quick conclusion to this chapter, you really need to know this. Public goods, not enough of them. Common resource, people eat them up too much. Because this is an externality. If you can really remember that, you're going to be good for this chapter. Okay.